Um, there are four of us that are, have been working on this project, um, some with terrible names to pronounce. Um, <laughs> but one, it, the person who maybe did the hardest work actually isn't up here, that's Bert Remesen. All the data that you're going to see here and um, much of the analysis, in fact, pretty much everything that we as a group know about Schillick, we know through him. He, um, so just to tell you where we're getting this information. We're talking um, about the interaction of timing and scaling um, in the realization of lexical tone in this language. So just um, by way of background, in the autosegmental metrical tradition, um, scaling and timing of tonal targets are effectively orthogonal dimensions of phonological representation. And by that, I just mean that they're independently variable, right? You, a high tone, first you, you can select a toneme, so you can pick a high tone or a mid-tone or a low tone or what have you. And then having done that, we can talk about how that tone is related to the segmental skeleton. Um, and looking at some tone systems like this, we get, we get a lot of nice insights into the structures of certain languages. So that there's a very small piece of Will Laban's famous analysis of Mende, um, where we want to be able to say that for uh, nominal roots, there's a small number of tone melodies. Here we're looking at the melody low, high. And we want to be able to say that in some meaningful sense, that's the same melody, whether it's realized over a single syllable, whether it's realized as a low on one syllable and a high on the next, or if it's a low on, in a trisyllabic word, a low on the first and then a high plateau after it, right? There's some sense in which, despite those being very dif disparate looking F0 contours, they're instances of the same thing from the autosegmental auto mm -hmm. perspective. And intonation systems, in intonation systems, we get a lot of mileage out of the same kind of rep representational assumptions. So this is a famous example from Bob Ladd, the incredulity contour here. So a low, low, high, low, high. It's going to give you a very different F0 contour, whether you're realizing it on Sue or a driving instructor. And yet we want to be able to say that those are instances of the same linguistic category, right? That the same phonological categories are being used. And they happen to sound different depending on how we're realizing them. Um, a lot of researchers have then carried over this phonological insight into the study of phonetic realization. So when we take these two dimensions and think about them phonetically, usually people talk about uh, tonal alignment, and by that they mean something like the temporal relationship between a tonal target and whatever its segmental host might be. And then tone scaling, so that's where we're realizing the target in the frequency domain. Um, if you look at a kind of standard uh, phonetic implementation model for um, AM phonology is the, this target and interpolation approach. The idea here is that each phonological tone in a string projects its own phonetic target, and each of those targets gets realized at a particular time, and then also somewhere in F0 space. I gave you some inspirational quotes here, but the one, the top one is very, very well known. Bob Ladd cites it in his book. Uh, it's from Joster Brusa, who said, reaching a certain pitch level at a particular point in time is the important thing, not the movement rise or fall itself, right? So there are those two dimensions that we're talking about in the realization of the target. Um, our kind of big general point that we want to make today, which I've labeled big general point for today, is um, timing and scaling may be separable at some relatively abstract level of phonological analysis, but they're, they're linked in the signal, particularly in perception, um, in such a way that altering one of them usually, if not always, alters the other as well. And the kinds of interactions that we find can end up muddying the distinctions that we tend, that autosegmental metrical theory wants us to make between contrasts that are essentially timing based and contrasts that are essentially scaling based. Um, which um, we know, not even talking about production, in which, in which obviously these things interact in many ways, but just talking only about perception. We know that scaling and timing interact in lots and lots of ways. There are all, there's a big literature on all the the different ways these things can affect one another perceptually. I'm, I just gave you a very short list of some of, some of them here, and I don't think we need to go through them um, now. I'll give you specific examples where they're relevant. What I want to say is that I think the implications of these interactions, of these phenomena and phonological systems is still not broadly appreciated. Which brings us around to Schillich. <laughs> 
Shilluk is a Western Nilotic language spoken in um, South Sudan. Um, it's described by Remesin and Ayoker as realizing a typologically unusual contrast between two falling tones which are timed differently within the syllable um, that bears them. In particular, there's one fall which is a, a relatively early fall, and then there's another which is a relatively later fall. Um, what, what Remesin and Ayoker are interested in doing is just demonstrating that this is in fact the case, that there is such a timing contrast in this language. The reason they want to do that is because it's been claimed that there aren't such things. Um, so they demonstrate that this does look like a timing contrast based on their data, and then they talk about how we could represent such a, such a timing contrast using some variant of autosegmental auto metrical representation. Um, our primary focus for now is not going to be on that, but rather on the phonetic implementation of the contrast. Okay, so a little bit more background here about Schillock. On monosyllabic transitive verbs, and apparently almost all transitive verbs are um, closed monosyllables, on monosyllabic transitive verbs we have um, eight contrasting tone contours that don't seem to be analyzable beyond this. So we've got low, mid, high, early, low fall, early, high fall, those are going to be the um, late high fall, those last two are going to be what we care about, high fall to mid, and rise. Um, here are some examples. This is just taken from Remesin and Ayoker. What we're looking at here, in all, all the tones that we're going to care about are on the verbs. So this syllable, which is leng here, this is going to be the verb root. It's preceded by a prefix um, realizing past tense, which has a high tone. And then the tonal changes on the verb root are giving us either which lexical item it is or a variety of different morphosyntactic categories that can be realized on it. Okay, so there, there are eight, of, eight possibilities here. Um, I had some sound files which were blown up. No, they are not blown up. I apologize. <laughs> That's lovely. Uh, this is an early high fall. Um, <laughs> The early high fall in somebody has beaten it in this place sounds like this. Again, you're listening to Leng. And this is the late high fall. Somebody went to the village to beat it. Okay. Um, you can see, I think you can make out the yellow high lit region here. Um, it's marked N, that's the, nuclear, the vowel nucleus of that syllable. And you can see it, it looks like in the, the fall is indeed happening earlier in the syllable for the early high fall than for the late high fall. Okay? Um, what Remesin and Ayoker did, they wanted, they wanted to look at four different falling contours. Two of them, the middle two here, in terms of their left to right progression, are the early high fall and the late high fall. The one before that would be an example of a high tone on the preceding syllable and a low on the target syllable. The last one to the right, where you don't actually see much of the fall at all, that's a high tone on the target syllable, and there is a fall, it's followed by a low. Okay, so they're looking at two tone, uh, they're looking at four falling contours. Um, but in particular, concerning the early high fall and the late high fall, they wanted to establish what the nature of the contrast was, and particularly that it was timing and not scaling. So the way they did with this was they measured the F0 at a particular point in time in the utterance, which they identified as the target. In this case, they, they oper operationalized the target for the high as the onset of the fall. Um, and they found this, I guess, semi-automatically. Um, so they found the onset of the fall and they marked where it happened in time and how high F0 was at that point. Um, and what they found, you can see the results on the left here, that's, um, those are the error bars or standard deviations here, those are um, early high fall on the top, late high fall below it, they pretty clearly don't overlap. One is earlier in time relative to the beginning of the tone bearing syllable than the other. The scaling of that target point is on the right. And those error bars pretty obviously overlap, right? There's not, there doesn't look like there's a scaling difference there. Um, so they conclude on that basis that this is a timing distinction that doesn't have anything else built into it phonetically. They also look at duration and some other things to see whether there's anything else that's letting us, um, anything else that we might be using to make this distinction. But um, if you 
blow up that picture a little bit, if you look at just the early high fall and the late high fall, you might notice about them um, there is indeed a timing difference. The red line is falling later than the early one, but you, you might also observe that it kind of looks like the red one is a little bit higher than the blue one. Through, in fact, it's higher than the blue one throughout its entire duration. Um, that makes it look like maybe there is some kind of scaling dimension to this contrast, but if so, why didn't it come out in their analysis? Um, and so this is not to criticize um, Romason and IOCare in any way. What they did is absolutely standard operating procedure for an autosegmental metrical analysis. But what they did is they, they measured timing and scaling at the same point under the assumption that a target for a tone happens at a single moment and it has whatever properties it has at that moment, both its height and its timing, right? That's the target and interpolation approach. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that in, in many ways that's not quite right. Um, at least for scaling, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the perception of tone scaling involves some kind of integration of F0 information over a broader window rather than simply extracting F0 at a single point in the contour. So one, one really well-known effect like this, I'm going to push my luck on the sound files, one very well-known um, example of this is the difference between plateau-shaped accents and sharp peak-shaped accents. And this is English, but in, this has been documented for speakers of a variety of languages. Um, here, if you have, we have a, a high pitch accent on the word Mary, two instances of it. One is sharp and the other's um, a plateau. Mary, Mary. Hey, that worked too. Mary, Mary. Many people judge the second one to sound higher, despite the fact that they have the same maximum F0, right? So it's been, it's been shown by a lot of people in a lot of contexts that plateaus sound higher than analogous peaks with the same maximum F0. So why should that be the case? Well, people have given different kinds of explanations for it. Um, Rachel and Knight um, attributes it to the, the temporal extent of the plateau that somehow it gives you a better chance of hearing the maximum F0 whereas for the sharp peak, you're only there for a moment, and so you might miss it. The way our group has approached this is following a lot of other scholars and assuming that the perception of F0 targets involves some form of averaging F0 over time. Um, and in particular, so there, this can be operationalized in various ways, but for this contrast between sharp peak and plateau, just the mean F0s of the syllables would be enough to give you this. So if you look at these examples, it's it should be fairly obvious that to the extent that F0 stays around at the maximum for a longer proportion of the target syllable in the plateau than it does in the sharp peak, it's going to have a higher mean F0. And if that is actually what's giving you your perception of that F0 event scaling, it's going to sound higher, which indeed it does. Um, Mean F0 is probably much too simple, and probably we're going to be doing something a little bit more complicated in integrating this F0 information. I won't talk about these things unless you're curious, but it could be that not just the F0 itself, but things about voice quality might be influencing the weight of the F0 samples in this average that we're making, um, other spectral properties of the segments, um, the slopes of pitch movements, all of these things could be playing a role. But for now, let's just talk about it as mean F0. And let's go back to Schillich. So these falls have a, a sort of plateau and then a fall in their standard realizations. And so if you look back at the red line and the blue line, actually, if this fact about sharp peaks and plateaus that we've seen from languages like English is a general fact about pitch perception and Schillich speakers experience it too, which Maybe they do and maybe they don't. That's something that should be verified. It's been, it's been claimed that speakers of different languages process pitch in importantly different ways. But um, assuming that this is true for Schillich speakers as well, what we would predict is that even if those two contours had exactly the same top line there, the fact that one of them fell later than the other would also cause it to sound higher just because it's got a higher mean F0. But we can also notice that it isn't actually an identical top line. It is higher. And so you might think of this as 
what we started thinking of this as was maybe a timing contrast that by virtue of the way it was being implemented brought a scaling contrast perceptually along for free such that people began implementing it with a real scaling distinction. You could think of it as scaling enhancing a timing contrast in some way. So the two features seem to be integrating perceptually. Um, it's not obvious that you would want to call it scaling enhancing timing and not vice versa, but we'll talk about that in a second. We, did, we wanted to go back and look at the data a little bit more carefully though, so we reanalyzed um, Remesen and IOCARE's data, and the only thing we did different was instead of measuring F0 at the fall onset, we measured maximum F0 in the target syllable. Um, and we, the reason we did that and not mean F0, we expect those things to be different, and indeed they were in terms of mean F0, but that would be true even if the top lines were exactly the same for the falls. So we want to see are people actually realizing the one higher in some sort of objective frequency space. And um, so we measured the, the maximum F0 on the target syllables. Um, these are nine speakers, eight male, one, one female. Um, and here, here's what we found. So you can see on the right, the late high fall over, averaged over the nine speakers, and those are 95% confidence intervals. It turns out are significantly higher. Uh, the maximum F0 is significantly higher for the late high fall than for the early high fall. And we did a, a mixed low logistic regression analysis of this in which both timing and scaling end up being significant. It's not quite that simple though because it turns out speakers seem to be implementing this in our admittedly very small sample of nine speakers. There seem to be differences in how individual speakers are realizing this contrast. It seems that while everybody has some realization of the timing contrast, some speakers, and these are averages over productions from individual speakers, the speaker on the right here, you could see that as somebody that's really realizing these two things primarily as a timing contrast. Maybe the maximum F0 is essentially the same and one is just falling later than the other. The speaker on the left, though, is really realizing a pretty big difference in scaling. And it's not totally obvious, at least, that the timing profile of them is, is radically different. Um, we came to call these two groups uh, scalers and timers for the realization of um, this contrast. And indeed, if you admittedly pretty ham-handedly do as we did and just by eyeballing average pitch contours lump all of the nine speakers either into a scalar group or a timer group depending on what they kind of seem like they're doing, it happened that four of them fell into the timer group and five of them fell into the scalar group. The scalar group, there's that same significant clear difference between maximum F0 for the early high fall and the late high fall. The timer group, maybe they have a trace of it, but there's a lot of overlap there between the categories and it turns out not to be significant in their regression analysis. So it looks like of our very small sample, half are using scaling and half aren't, um, at least in the systematic way. This ends up looking a lot like another well-known case in the literature, which I won't go into, but these facts are very, very strongly reminiscent of a contrast in Gothenburg, Swedish, where this is something that in most of Swedish it starts out as a timing contrast, but in Gothenburg, the high that usually is realized later in the syllable starts to also be realized higher. So the, it's the late equals high pattern that's been found in a couple of different languages. And indeed in Gothenburg, Swedish, um, apparently, the shift is happening in such a way that some speakers realize that primarily one lexical pitch accent is later than the other. Other speakers realize that primarily as one lexical pitch accent is higher than the other. And some people go back and forth depending on possibly even register. You um, can talk more about Gothenburg Swedish if you want in the questions. Um, what I want to say um, about both of these things is that it makes us ask what kind of contrast we're actually looking at, given that we have these two possibilities in autosegmental representation. Is it timing? Is it scaling? Is it both? Is it something else? In principle, we could say that Schillick is implementing a timing contrast and that in some way scaling is being used as an enhancing cue to that contrast. But we could also just as easily say Schillick is realizing a scaling contrast. 
It's got a high fall versus, say, a super high fall. That's not a crazy thing to find in a tone system. And maybe there's some timing aspect to that phonetically. Um, the troubling part of this is that I don't know of any good reason to prefer the one analysis over the other, either in this instance or in Gothenburg Swedish, or, or in principle really anywhere given data like this. And to the extent that patterns like this are common, it makes one wonder whether the choice between these things, which is suggested to us by our representational apparatus, is really well posed to begin with. Um, we've worked a little bit on Gothenburg Swedish, and, we've, and it turns out that those data can be um, the link between late and high can be understood with reference to the same sort of mean F0 uh, feature that we're talking about for Schillock there as well. Um, so maybe that's, maybe the connection between the scaling and the timing dimension are the same in both of those two languages. We also think that something like that um, uh, weighted average, weighted frequency average that we've in, in, other, um, in other places called tonal center of gravity in the frequency domain, that this may be generalizable to what seem like instances of the opposite pattern in the literature, things that look like earlier equals higher. There's a neat, neat case in Egyptian Arabic, which um, I won't talk about, but it does look like it may generalize to a range of different um, frequency timing interactions. Um, the, the conclusions that I want to reach here are just, first we have this small result, which is what looked like it was a pure timing contrast taken under standard auto-segmental metrical assumptions, turns out to have a scaling dimension built into it as well. Um, that scaling pattern, later, later equals higher, turns out to, it turns up in, in tone and intonation systems around the world. We think we have an account of the connection between those two phonetic dimensions that can reference averaging F0 information, integrating F0 information over time. And then it, broader conclusions, we think timing and scaling interactions like this are, are actually way more common than is probably uh, currently appreciated. And probably tonal implementation always involves dynamic interactions among cues in perception between dimensions that otherwise seem like they're logically separable, um, as we've seen abundantly in the study of segmental phonology. Um, current autosegmental metrical theory, though, we feel, given this distinction in representation between timing and scaling, is not able to handle the fluidity of this interaction in as insightful a way as we wish it could. And we think there, that something is being missed there. That's what I have. Thank you, this was very interesting. Um, and just picking up on this last point you made about how um, the AM theory cannot really handle this, the interaction of these factors, do you have any hypotheses about how it might be able to handle them? Um, yes, <laughs> we, we have some. So, um, I'm just thinking about how far to go out on the limb that I'm in and then saw off behind myself. <laughs> Yeah, so if you, think, if you think about what happens, I'll answer this with reference to segmental phonology because this is how I've been trying to think about it. What we're looking at is an instance of trading between cues or percep perceptual interaction between cues in a domain that we didn't necessarily expect them to interact this way, but they seem to be interacting. And when we see things like this happen in, in segmental phonology, so if you take an example, what I was thinking about earlier, because Schillick has this too, is actually some of John's work on um, advanced tongue root and breathiness, where you seem to have a relationship like this of perceptual integration. Schillick has a 10-vowel system, and five of them are 
fiber ATR and fiber, fiber plus ATR and fiber minus. And there's a vowel quality distinction that seems to involve tongue root position there. The ATR vowels are also breathy. And so if you think about, well, what, what do we do with that um, featurally? We, we could say, okay, the, these two dimensions are integrating perceptually. What phonological feature is this? Well, we could just call it ATR and say, oh, and the ATR vowels are breathy. And maybe there would be things about the rest of the phonology of the language that would make us think that that was a good idea. Maybe it looked like tongue, a tongue root system in other languages. There's not tongue root harmony in this language, but. Um, or maybe there would be aspects of its phonology that would make us prefer to call it breathiness. Um, and there's a vowel quality association with that. That's, that's a possibility. What otherwise has been done, um, and maybe this is even your preference, John, in this case, certainly as good students of Jakobson, Font, and Halley, what we could do is step back and say, maybe what this actually is, is there's some kind of superordinate featural contrast to which both of those things are cues. So let's call it tense versus lax. And maybe tense versus lax sounds different in different languages. And if we're talking about a register language in Southeast Asia, then it sounds like one thing. And if we're talking about shillik, it sounds like another thing. But that's the feature that we're using. And to the extent that we're able to make decisions like that about segmental phonology, I think it's mostly because we just have a, a strong tradition and strong intuitions about what the features are and what, what inventories are like and what natural class behaviors are like. And um, we can ask Christian about features in tone systems, but at least I think it's fair to say that our intuitions about what natural class behaviors are like in tone inventories are at least less universal. Um, our notions of what a tone inventory should be like are less strong than our notions of what a vowel inventory should be like. I think that's, I think that's safe to say. So we might say, rather than choosing, oh, to get back around <laughs> at great length to your question, rather than choosing its scaling or its timing in this case, we probably don't want to say it's both because you would never say the vowels of this language are plus ATR and plus breathy because, again, as good students of Jakobson, Font, and Halley, we want economical representations. And to the extent that there's redundancy, we only want one of those features. But maybe there's a superordinate category here. Maybe we, there's something that unifies those things. We don't have that tense lax category waiting for us here to unify scaling and timing. People have made stabs at it. So they're actually the people who started, who um, did the original work on Gothenburg Swedish, proposed to try to capture the interaction between scaling and timing or the later versus higher thing there using the area under the F0 curve. So maybe the, the real feature was something like bigger accents versus smaller accents. Or if you think of the vowel as like a vessel for high F0, then it's like plus or minus full, <laughs> effectively. Uh, uh, but then uh, how would that account for the scalars versus timers distinction? Yeah, I guess they would both be ways of implementing that distinction phonetically to the extent that those things are integrating perceptually, to the extent that they're both creating some sort of, that they're both, that they're both activating a single sort of auditory percept. You could do it this way or you could do it that way. And some people do both and some people only do one. Yeah. I, th I think there are reasons not to prefer the area under the curve approach to it. Um, we actually did some experimental work looking at perception of different kinds of combination among American English speakers of a made up dialect of Swedish. <laughs> looking at uh, lateness and highness and it turns out that what you would predict given area under the curve doesn't quite work. But the idea of some sort of superordinate feature that's being accessed, that's, that's an interesting thought. It's not something that's currently available to us in the way we the way we represent tone systems. I'm, I'm Jura Shimka from Helsinki. Um, 
this reminds me, this is just a comment rather than a contribution to what you were just saying, because it reminds me very much of the quantity contrast, the way how quantity contrast is realized in some languages like Finnish and Estonian, where it turns out that quantity, the, yeah, the were other than, you know, quantity contrast, long versus short vowels and consonants are, is usually uh -huh. kind of considered durational contrast, so we measure how long the thing is, but it turns out that it's equally total contrast, that the long vowels are usually realized with the falling contour, while the short ones are sort of realized with the high contour. So, yeah, it's kind of, it, it, I would just expand what you were saying over to quantity contrast as having some, whether the binary feature or then we have Estonian where we have the three-way quantity contrast, so the features don't have to be binary in that sense. Mm -hmm. So they might be just the contrast, just the way of realizing contrast because that's what we need in order to communicate. And there are many ways and our perceptual systems allow for many ways to do that and this, this is an excellent example. And I mean, it, yeah, it, that's, a, that's an interesting point and it, it brings what you just said about is, what kind of contrast is it? Well, it's a contrast. It, that brings, it brings to mind some, thi some things that um, I think Mark Brunel and James Kirby have said, looking at things like, like register contrasts in Southeast Asian languages where people were trying to look at a given language and say, is it mostly tone or is it mostly voice quality or is it vowel quality or what is it? And it, there's some sense in which making that you're making a false distinction there. What you're doing is implementing one lexical category that's different from another lexical category and you're keeping them separate phonetically. The problem then is if we're allowed to create categories like that or if we're allowed to basically have contentless phonological features, I'm not sure where that leads us. Certainly the, the, lose the job. Sorry? We lose the job. We lose our job. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we lose our job. Um, <laughs> It, uh, yeah, so we have, we have tone, you know, I was saying before, we have tone Bob, and that contrasts with tone Jim, and they just, they don't have any content, but um, I, I'm not sure that's satisfying. And it certainly doesn't make predictions about how that, those things should behave. So in segmental phonology, if we did that, we would run up against, oh, but look at all this natural class behavior where we can really see back vowels behave like back vowels, and front vowels behave like front vowels, and here's all this evidence that the phonology knows about this, and so just calling ooh an unanalyzable category that's different from e, that's different from a, that's not insightful. We're losing information about the grammar. But the problem is in a lot of tone systems, and not all of them, as Christian was <laughs> telling me, but in a lot of tone systems, that natural class behavior isn't there to really tell us the right way of thinking about this tone is like this. And so a lot of what drives people's phonological representations is really just the idea that features or representations are there to basically tell the articulators what to do. If, if, this, if this is high, low, high, it's because the pitch starts high and goes down and then goes back up. But it, we could reasonably ask whether, whether the phonetics really needs such instructions from the phonology. If, or, I, if I may, maybe, yeah. maybe these sort of contrasts are not arbitrary. You know, they are sort of, they are underlined by our perception and production systems as they are. So we cannot, anyway, let's continue later. Let's continue later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.